Buddy? Oh, we got the sound system working. That's good. We're, we're glad that you're here. And that you've found your favorite place to sit. If you really want to be cool, you sit over here. If you're kind of medium people, in the middle. But if you like it warm, you're over on this side. So this church is full of choices. And so we're really glad you're here, that you've made the choice to take this morning together with others who love God to worship Him and to be instructed by His Word and to enjoy fellowship with each other. Greetings to those who are watching by way of the internet. May God bless you and your home and uh, your family. Let us hear the word of the Lord as David writes this. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known throughout all generations. I will declare your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven. Father, as we come together this morning, we, we find ourselves really amazed that you love us as you do, that it's so intense and so complete, that you've withheld nothing that is good for us. And any doubts that we might have about your love are washed away when we look at Jesus Christ, your Son, sent to be our Savior and our Lord. We thank you that you confirmed his identity to us by raising him from the dead. And we thank you for his promise that when we gather together in his name, that he is present. And so we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to guide us in our worship and in all that we do together, and not only this hour, but throughout this week. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's, uh, it's good to be back this week. I uh, appreciate all the people up here and to John and Will who were able to fill in this week as I went on vacation out west. It was nice to get away, first time in a long time, so I appreciate you all letting me go. Um, yeah, as you can tell this morning, things are a little changed up. I thought, change it up last week, why not keep it going, right? So we're going to do more of an acoustic feel, which I always say I kind of like because it just kind of draws it back and it gives us more of a focus on what we're actually singing about. And uh, one more thing, Sandy told me there's no children's church today, so before I forget, i got to say that. Got you, Sandy. So at this time, let's, uh, let's stand up this morning and let's worship the Lord. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yes, my praise Testimony, this is my testimony. Whoa. 
done and Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done and Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous out west there I was uh, went to this place and we were exhausted from this day we had and uh, we decided to go out anyway to this place right here and there was we decided to go for this sunset we were just exhausted but we climbed out onto this rock and I didn't, couldn't really see until I climbed over that bottom rock on the bottom there and when this thing appeared instantly this song that we're about to sing overwhelmed came on and I was so overwhelmed by by just the goodness of the God goodness of God and just his creation I mean look at that picture obviously it's just amazing that some people think there's not a creator out there of something that beautiful, right? So I just wanted to share this with you. There's nothing special, really, I'm going to say about this song. We've done it so many times, but if you're just not, if you're not overwhelmed by God's creation, you, I, I just think you got to look harder. And you don't even need something like that to show it to you. But I was just so overwhelmed. So let's just sing this song together. I see the works of your hands The galaxy spinning a heavenly dance Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming I hear the sound of your voice All at once it's a gentle and thundering Oh God, and all that you are is so overwhelming. And I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. And I'm overwhelmed. I'm you've done is so overwhelming and I delight myself in you in the glory of your presence I'm overwhelmed and I'm overwhelmed by you and God I run into your Shit. 
You are beautiful, you are beautiful, oh God. There is no one more beautiful, you are beautiful, God, you are the most beautiful. You are glorious, you are glorious, oh God, there is no one more glorious, you are glorious, God, you are the most glorious, you're glorious, you're glorious. so hard to see it took me so long to believe it you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve and you take the broken things, you raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, I am who you say I am. Crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Now I can finally see it, it's teaching me how to receive it. Let all the striving cease And this is my victory You are my champion And giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say I am You crown me has given me when I open up my mouth miracles 
start breaking out I have the authority Jesus has given me When I lift my voice and shout Good morning. Before we go to prayer this morning, I just wanted to let you know that our brother Daniel in Myanmar has been able to get to um, a place where he has internet available, and he is hopefully um, viewing right now our online service and extremely happy to be doing so. But he's asked specifically that we be praying for him continuously as we know their country is in great turmoil he runs an orphanage there, so he asks us to continue to pray for him, for the safety of him and his wife and his children and all the orphans um, that are in this house. So if you could continue um, to pray for him. And Daniel, if you're watching right now, I say um, good morning to you and blessings to you from all your Lincourt family. So this morning, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, I do shout out to you this morning, God, because I know that, that, that the walls do come crashing down, Lord, when we come to you before you humbly in prayer and ask you, God, for your protection and your provisions. So this morning, Lord, I do pray that, God, for our brothers and, and, and sisters in Myanmar and all those that they are looking after, God, I pray a special hand of protection over them, Lord. I thank you, God, for giving us this place to worship you, and to hear your word. And I just pray, God, that as we get ready to, to look into your word, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would move in this church family, would move in the hearts of all that are here, Lord, and that your word would be delivered in exactly the way that you plan on it being delivered. God, I pray for Pastor Wayne. I pray for the worship team. I pray for everyone here, God, that they would hear your word. And I ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. So you can be seated, and we're, we are going to read from um, the book of Matthew this morning in chapter 10. In verse 5, Jesus is about to send out his 12 apostles, and he's going to be giving them instructions. So the instructions are these. Do not go among the Gentiles or, any, or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Amen. Last week we talked about sowing. And we talked about God providing the seed. We talked about God's in charge of the harvest. 
And we talked about God's grace in our life that changes us really to become a sower of his seed. This week, I want to talk about the harvest and the harvesting. So last week was like kind of the book work, right? We're in class, we're, we're listening, we're taking notes and all that kind of thing. In a sense, this week is that project, right? At the end of the semester, now you have to have your project and it's due. And so that's what I want to talk about this. I want to highlight um, one verse this morning in chapter 10 of Matthew. And it's the 24, 24th verse. And this is just a reminder to us of placement, right? And Jesus says this to the disciples. A student is not above his teacher, nor is a servant above the master. Now we hear this phrasing from Jesus, we hear this sentence, and we could say, yeah, well that's true, right? We know that a student is immature compared to a mature teacher on any subject that is given. We can understand the idea of the student may be an apprentice and is working underneath a master, if we think about it from the sense of woodworking or any of the other trades, that there's always this apprenticeship thing that happens with a master to become to that point. And we understand it in the sense that novice and expert. We get that. The teacher is the teacher. In some way, the student is the student. But let's look at this phrase through like this, a little bit of this lens today. Thinking about the teacher's journey. How long does it take to become a teacher in a certain subject, right? The more difficult the subject, the longer the schooling it takes and all that. But when a student looks at a teacher, sometimes I think the student forgets about the journey that the teacher took and, and got to the point where they're teaching. We think about the amount of time that teachers have placed in their education and, and placed in their ability to, to get things ready and, and, and also their ability not only of what's going to be taught but how they actually teach it, how they give it to the students. And teachers certainly have responsibility, right? Teachers have a responsibility to, to make sure that the, the student is getting the information. Are they understanding what I'm saying? And then there's a the responsibility of testing and, and seeing if they, if they comprehend it. And then, of course, when it comes to a lot of teachers, when it comes to trades and things like that, there's the teacher's example of their work, what they've done and what their ability is, and a student can look at it. Many times, though, I've noticed that the student wants to jump to the teacher position. I hear, hear some of the hmm things. Without exercising through or experiencing what the teacher did to become the teacher. And I, and I think about that. Why is it that we, in a sense, want to move ourselves to a position of not being a student anymore and move to a place of, I've got it all, Right? And lots of times when you think about it, I remember asking, when the teacher would ask to write a paper, and when then, then they would tell you how many pages long it had to be. And that right there was the thing that got me. 10 to 12 pages about that subject? No, 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 no. The journey is too long. It's too long. I could really, one paragraph would do that for you, ma'am. And lots of times students want that position of teacher without the responsibility of what it really truly means to be a teacher. We want to teach, we want to talk, we want to spill what we have in our head, but we don't really want to take the responsibility after we're done talking. Really, lots of times we just want that position without the work that it takes to get it. Sometimes we see the teacher as like, in a sense, the boss, and, and really, truly, we want to be the boss in life, and so we were just like, listen... Just move over a little bit. Let me back up on that shelf too and we'll kind of co-teach together this class, right? You see, really what I'm talking about is Christianity. And what I'm talking about is the way that we view God as the teacher and us as student. Lots of time it's like, move over, Grandpa. I'm coming up here with you and help you out on some of this stuff in life. Are you with me today? But a student is not above the teacher and a servant is not above the master. So Jesus picks... 12 um, disciples to become students. Come follow me, he says to them. 
They may not understand the process. They may not understood how it worked. They may not understand the suffering and all that. But what they did understand from their thing, they, they answered this call of come follow me. And Jesus explained to them at least this much, I will make you fishers of men. They knew what the background of fishing was. He pulled some of them out of that. But they certainly understood that Jesus was calling them to something that they weren't. Thus the word, I will make in you something that you're not. They entered into this relationship between the student and the teacher. And when we become Christians, we also enter into a student-teacher relationship with God. But many people love to stay in this idea of I enter into the relationship of Jesus as my Savior, the forgiver of my sins, the one that represents me before God, that ushers me into heaven. I love that Jesus that's full of grace, that's full of understanding, that loves me and all that. And that's what the Christian, in a sense, holds on to. But then there's this thing more that's happening. And I'm going to need my water, Randy, if you would. There's more that's happening here after the Savior idea. There's this idea of Lord. And when we think about Lord, the Lord is the one that has the position of actually saying, this is where we're going to go, this is how we're going to do it, and all that kind of thing. And this is where the master and the servant thing struggle with us. But Jesus is very clear. I am to be both your Savior and Lord. In chapter 9 of Matthew... We get into an overview of what Jesus was doing even before he finished calling all of his disciples. And in this chapter of 9, he has many disciples called, but he also calls Matthew to be a disciple. But what's, what's he doing in chapter 9 of Matthew? Well, he's, he's healing people. A paralyzed man in, chapter, in verse 2. A girl restored to life in verse 18. A woman healed of her bleeding in verse 20. In verse 27, two men blind were were healed. A man unable to speak in verse 32. And so Jesus has got these disciples with him, and he's calling that last disciple, and he's going around, and he's doing these things, and they're seeing, and they're learning. Going from town to town, he was demonstrating his power. He was demonstrating the love for the people that he had as he came into their village and saw their condition and what they were like. And also, he was doing the next thing, which I want to really emphasize today. He was calling them back to God. The kingdom of heaven is near, or the kingdom of heaven has come, and and I want you to come back to this place that you once were at. By the end of chapter 9, He had called the 12 disciples. And he says to them in verse 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The teacher is saying this to the students. The harvest is plentiful. And you know, I guess they could just think back and they he. The disciples could say, you know what, maybe Jesus is is talking about all those people that he just got done healing and helping. And he's right, every village that we come into, there's somebody that's in tremendous need. And Jesus is is, is just doing it. He's meeting them where they're at and he's healing them. And so Jesus, you're right, this, this harvest of broken, sick, diseased people is before us. In verse 36, for Jesus saw the crowds. With his own eyes, he had compassion on what he saw of them. Because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus notices them. And Jesus knew the problems that they had and he saw them and he calls the condition one of an incredibly huge harvest. But there's this worker few problem that needs to be worked out. The teacher understood the situation. He understood the harvest. He understood the condition of people. But the workers, 
they're not the same. They don't see the big picture of what the teacher is trying to get across. And the workers have to learn and, and start to understand the helplessness of people and to have the compassion level of Jesus is going to take some stirring of the heart and is going to take some instruction and is going to take some reminder of who he is. And then in verse 38, Jesus said this, Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in his harvest field. I just want you to think about what Jesus is saying here. The field is already there and is identified. The harvest is already to the point in which it's ready to be taken in. And so Jesus, speaking to the disciples, speaking to the students, says, you know, we ought to be asking God, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers. In other words, God can change their worker's heart. And God can do something about the lack of workers. <clears throat> and really, Jesus says to the disciples as we enter into chapter 10, he's saying this to them You are the answer to the worker problem. You're few. There's only 12 of you here right now. But you are what I'm sending out into this incredible harvest field. You 12. And in chapter 10, he calls the 12 disciples and he gives them authority in verse 1 to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. He gives them, the students, the ability, the power and the authority to do this in his name. He says, look, I'm going to, I want you to go in. I want you to do this. You've seen me do it. I want you to do it. <clears throat> and after that, in verse 7, I want you to do this. I want you to speak to them and, and say this. The kingdom of God is here. The power of God has been demonstrated in your town, in your village. And he's here. Come back. See, the purpose of God's power is for this message to be seen as real, to be seen as true, to be seen as in power that God is in that village in that moment. And he sends them into the towns and the village. And look where he sends them. He says, look, I'm going to send you to the, the lost sheep of Israel. That's your brothers and your sisters. That's the one who've we're raised in the synagogue and know the Passover and know all these things. This is where I'm sending you. To these, this place of a harvest that already knows of me. That have probably worshipped me at some point. Probably placed some faith in who I was at some point. They have the tradition and have the heritage. This is who I'm sending you to. And this is what I'm labeling as the harvest for you 12. To make sure you're clear on this, I don't want you to go to the Gentiles. I don't want you to go to Syria. I don't want you to go anywhere else. I want you to stay right here in this harvest field. And he warns them. He says, look, there's going to be some persecution. And we see that in verse 17. There's going to be flogging. Some of you guys are going to be taken in by the villages. And what you say to them and what you do is going to be fearful to them. It's going to be scary to them. And they're going to respond with violence. And they're going to strike you on the back and on the face. And some of you are going to be arrested while you go to these towns and these villages. Even though you're demonstrating the power of God over sickness, that you're healing people, that you're casting demons out and giving people new life, even though that's happening, even though they can see it, they're going to arrest you because. But listen, here's the deal. In verse 28, Jesus says this, and which is a hard thing for us to get over. Just don't be afraid. Are you kidding me? I'm afraid already. I'm just reading this. I haven't even gone out yet. We haven't even left the doors of the church, and already I'm worried about being flogged. I'm worried about being arrested. I'm worried about being treated horribly. But Jesus says, you know what? Don't be afraid of those that can kill you. But I am, and so are you today. We're afraid of people and violence.
Then the teacher says this. <clears throat> he's talking to the students. He's talking to the disciples. He says, look, in, in verse 32 of chapter 10, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge him before the Father in heaven. This is your goal as a student. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go out and acknowledge God to these villages and to these towns where Israel is. And I want you to tell them who I am and why I'm here. It's your job description. So the disciples had time with Jesus to learn, and there's some demonstrations that they, they got to see. They heard the words that he said and were amazed at the wisdom that he had and all these things. But now, but also, they had to go on their own to practice what they've learned, to speak, to teach, to heal, to help, to tell of God's kingdom. So many times as Christians, we want to stay in class. Stay where there's no confrontation. And all you have to do is, well, the teacher's speaking is think about something else in your head and you'll tune him out, right? Or tune her out. But see, sooner or later, Jesus is asking all Christians and like, okay, this is it. It's time to go out. But there seems that Jesus anticipated in their minds, in their thoughts, some type of pushback from the students. So one may have thought they were not ready to go, probably, right? I'm not ready, are you? No, I'm not ready either. I forgot to read the book last night. Me too. Maybe some of them thought, you know what, even though I understand what my, the project is, I get it and all that, I just... I think it's just too difficult to go to places I haven't been and to talk to people I don't know. But this is the thing. This is the test. You will or will not acknowledge God before others. So now he has this class in, in suspense there, right? Are you going or are you not going? Are you acknowledging or are you not acknowledging? I remember as a child, it was probably, you know, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, ten, somewhere in there. I remember going to Maine, where my aunt and uncle lived, and they lived on the water there. And my uncle brought me to a beach early one morning, and I can remember the sun coming up and all that, and we were there to find clams. I know nothing about clams other than the fact you go into the grocery store and there they are, Okay? But then as we walk the beach and the tide is out, he shows me and says, you see that air bubble right there? I'm like, yeah, I see that. Stick your hand right there and push it down and grab. You first, right? <laughs> and he reaches down, he goes and pulls up just like this. But that wasn't the only thing that this uncle thought that I needed to know or my dad thought I needed to know by sending me with that uncle. Next thing I know, we're on this lobster or this crab boat. And we come up in these nets, and he pulls up this big, huge thing and sets it in the middle of the thing, and he reaches in there, and there's these crabs, and they're this big around, and he grabs it, he breaks the leg off, throws it in the bucket, breaks the other leg, throws it off, and takes the crab and throws it. He says, this is what you need to do. You reach in there, you grab that thing, and by the way, it may, depending how slow or fast you are, pinch you. And on he grow and just keep talking and doing it. And I can remember breaking them off and throwing them in and doing the thing and all that. Then we got to the lobster part where we got to the lobster traps. And he pulled them up. They're a little bit bigger. Their pinches are a little bit bigger. And we had a job to do. Take them out of there, place them in this and all that kind of thing. You see, there is a part of us that has to be taught what to do, but sooner or later... You're going to have to stick your hand in the mud. You're going to have to reach for the crab. You're going to have to grab a lobster. And you're going to have to do what the teacher has instructed you to do. Sooner or later, what we learn has to be put into practice. Sooner or later. 
So as some of you know, I've been taking this B class. Once a month I go out to B class. And man, there's all kinds of things to learn at B class. I'm amazed at how fast two hours goes by and listening to these guys talk about bees and all these kind of things. So last week, I'm not sure what day it was. It was for last Sunday, but I came back from lunch. It was a Friday, I believe. Came back and I, I went and I went to the wood shop and I looked out to where the bees were and there was nothing but bees, millions and millions of bees in the orchard and they were flying around and I was like, what is going on in the orchard? And I got to the window and I looked down at the beehive and there's still bees coming in and out, but I just didn't understand where all this stuff was going, going and going and I looked a little bit closer to one of the trees, and all of a sudden I could see there was a swarm there of bees. And I'm like, the bees have swarmed. I learned about that in class. So I called my teacher. Hey, teacher, there's a bee swarm in my orchard. Oh, isn't that wonderful? No, it's not wonderful. They're all over the place. And, but he says, you've been in class. You know what to do. Go get your boxes. Go out to that orchard and put the bees back in the box. Who? I thought this was a bee class. I thought all I had to do was listen to you talk. And this is what he says. You can do it. No, I can't. Yes, you can. You see, I listened every time I went there, but now... The day was here, the you can do it day. And I didn't know if I could do it. I wasn't necessarily afraid of becoming the overbloated guy that dies from being stung a million times. That really didn't come into my mind. But the last time I was out there, I got stung right on the nose. And there was more than one bee out there this time. But if I didn't do it, the bees would be gone. I said, how long do I have? Great question. Like, do I have, like, procrastination time? He says, oh, you got somewhere between 20 minutes and maybe a few hours. But he says, you never know. They could be gone in an instant. You see, sooner or later, we have to understand being called by God is not just for our benefit as people. Sooner or later, we have to get through this idea of our salvation is a starting point for our discipleship. Sooner or later, we got to see that our salvation is a starting point for what you were freely giving. Now you will give to others. And it's to be the workers in the harvest to be the people who go into all the world and share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which saved me, which saved you, which can save them. Last week, we talked about sowing seeds. This week, we're talking about harvesting seeds. Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful. We're skeptical to that. We don't believe him. Because we'd all be bringing in fruit if we believed him. Go, though, in verse 5 and 6, go to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Man, I I was like, wow, does Jesus not care about the non-Jewish person? You know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the whole world. What about us, Jesus? No, of course he loves us. The point is Jesus has a plan. Go to where the harvest is already ready. When I was a teenage boy, I spent many summers in the wheat harvest in Canada on the farm. The wheat harvest is that end of July, right, that first of August, that time that in there, depending on the weather. But I remember this. I remember going out into the field To decide whether or not the harvest was ready was the point of why we would go out there. And we would take a bunch of the the wheat and pull it off and put it in our hands. And my uncle would take it and put it in his mouth. 
I thought he was just hungry. No, he was checking something with his teeth. And we'd grab enough, we'd bring it back to the machine, we'd put it in the machine, and the machine would say, yes, it's at this, t- it's at this moisture. And if it was 14.5, we were a go. We were going to be harvesting. You see, the question, is it ready for harvest, is a legit question. And I remember there was some certain rules that I learned there from my grandfather. You never harvest wheat before noon. It was always after lunch. I figured he just wanted to do it on a full belly. No. The the morning dew by then would be gone from the sun and the wind. And you never could go too long after dark because as soon as that sun went down, the heavy dew would come in and it would just stop the harvest machine cold. So there is actual practical ideas of when to harvest and when not to harvest. In other words, Jesus isn't just saying, listen, go out and just pull people in and all that kind of thing. No, there's a little bit of a plan here. Harvesting is not just some haphazard process of getting fruit from plants and gathering it. There's a process. Harvesting people for God, there's a process. And if God is in charge of the harvest, or the process, then don't you think that the teacher has something to say to the student about how this works? And what can we see of a process through what Jesus is teaching these 12 disciples in this moment? First of all, there's an idea of workers. That's part of the process. If there is no workers, there's no harvest going to come in. I don't care how ripe it is. Number two, he says to pray for the workers. Now, in a way, you almost want, think that he's identifying them, and then he's saying, pray for more. But I think if you look at it closely, you could almost say this. He's saying, pray for the workers in both realities, the ones that are going out now and the ones to come later. And you look at that later on when Jesus tells the parable, the guy that hires the four times during the day, Right? So what we can see in this process is there's workers, there's a need for workers, and Jesus says enter into prayer in that reality of the worker. Number two, God sends. Not us, God sends. And so in this particular case, he's telling them, identifying them, this is the deal. You are to go here and here only. Now, obviously he unleashes Peter later on, he unleashes Paul later on, and and lets them go to the Gentiles. But even in Paul's Gentile harvest, he is stopped by the Spirit many times from going different places because Paul is not in charge of the harvest. Who is? God is. So God sends, and it's Spirit-led on where we are to go with the harvest. Now, What's interesting, and think about this for a minute, and this is what God has impressed upon my heart this week. Part of where God wants us to go is people who have past knowledge of him. Go there first. And so God has identified two young gentlemen that I taught as a Sunday school teacher years ago To go, and I know they're no longer in the church. I'm in contact with them, though, because God is in charge of the what? Harvest. And I have to decide whether or not I'm going to be a worker. And so God has impressed upon me these two young gentlemen now. And so now I have this, this decision to make. Okay, God, if this is where you want me to speak, now the question is how, when, and where, and how is this all going to work out? But I'm going to trust in him for those things. Number two, what we can see of this process is this. It's work. And work is something that most people want to avoid. Persecution is something that most people want to avoid. Being yelled at or screamed at is things that people want to avoid. You have to understand this process of harvesting is absolutely work. It's tiring. But it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to do it. And the student sometimes doesn't think they need to do what the teacher says or has done. Because... I can only say it this way, 
they're above the teacher. Are you with me? It's quiet. Are you with me? Verse 32, the, the person who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before God. That's a strong statement that Jesus is speaking to the students about. Really, this is a lot about faith here. If you don't have enough faith to acknowledge me before men and women, then how does your faith make me acknowledge you before God? Show me this faith by what you do. Thank you. See, the opposite is also true in verse 33 of chapter 10. But whoever disowns me, I will disown. That's, 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 that's a scary situation right there. It's a motivating thing, though. Jesus is motivating, saying, look, this is some truth here. It's a motivating truth. Or you think that maybe <laughs> Jesus is only talking about the response to the question or to the gospel that you're going to bring? To In other words, so you're looking at this verse in 32 and 33 in this way. Let me walk this through with you. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge. So in other words, you're reading it this way. You're saying, you know, I'm going to go up to John and I'm going to say, John, you know what? Here's the, here's the story of Christ. Here's the story and all that. And if he doesn't acknowledge me, then you know what? Then that's the deal. But don't just read it that way. Please read it in the fact. If you're not going to go out and you're not going to say who God is, then you are not acknowledging him before others. We're always trying to go and think about what they're going to say in response. This is very clear. You have an acknowledgement sowing situation that you have to do regardless of what they say back. The one who brings the gospel is the one who also acknowledges Jesus Christ through the process of bringing that to somebody. The process of harvesting is, is, is that thing of, listen, <clears throat> I see your condition. I, I see your life. It, you, you, it's messed up. There's no peace there. There's no love there. And, and I don't know how you got here, but I know someone that can change this. And let me tell you my story, how he changed me. And maybe after we're done with this story, you could give him a chance of changing your life. <clears throat> I just acknowledged before men and women that God changed me and he can change you. But yet we make it more complicated than that. Your testimony, your story is, the, is what you are going to bring to them. This is who Jesus is. This is how I know because he did this for me. So here's my question today, and here's what I want us to walk out of here with, with this, this stirring of the heart that says, you know what, I'm not a great worker. I, I know that, and I have a lot of reasons why, because I am truly afraid of all those things that Jesus listed. I get that. We all can say we're not great workers at times. We're all in that boat together. But instead of looking at the past, let's look at tomorrow. And can you imagine if Jesus continued to push Peter about the past? No, he didn't. Peter's failures, Jesus asked him one question. Do you love me today? Then do this tomorrow. What happened there, happened there. I'm talking about now. Are you going to be a harvester, yes or no? Are you going to be a worker, yes or no? So here's what I want us to think about. Who should I see? Ask me that question. Who should I see? I can guarantee if you're truly asking this question that God will identify somebody in your mind today. I think if you're truly willing to acknowledge him before somebody, God in your mind will bring someone to you that, know, that probably knows of God, that may have been in the church, that may have gone to Sunday school, that may have been to youth group, I don't know. But I know that there's someone God's going to identify. You ask God. Someone that probably already has somewhat of a, a background. And then you have to ask yourself this next question. 
Am I praying for them? Am I praying for the harvest? Not in just in general, God save the United States. Yes, Lord, please do. But Lord, start with this person here. Start with me and then bring it to them. Who should I go see, Lord? Identify that. And should, how should I start praying for that harvest? Lord, give me the words. Give me the opportunities. Make it so I know. And Lord, would you encourage me by sending more workers? Not just me, Lord, but would you raise up other workers? And Lord, do I really have a problem with being above you? Speak to me, Lord, if that's the case. I know I'm not above, but if that's my attitude, then change me. And for those of us today, that fear is the thing that stops a lot of things from happening in life. Jesus said this to them in regards to that. Don't be afraid, in verse 28 of chapter 10, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered by me. So don't be afraid You are worth more than many, many sparrows. You see, lots of time fear is about our misunderstanding of what we're supposed to have in life. All as God is saying is, look, I am in control. And if it's truly your time to die, it's your time. But you know what? You're only dying in the body. Your soul will be with me forever. So don't be worried about it so much. Forever is more important. Your soul is more important. You see, it's time to harvest. It's time to harvest. And Jesus says this in verse 8 of chapter 10. In the end of it, he says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. And look what he says next. Freely you have received. Everything that God has given to us was given by him to us freely. Now, freely give. Freely go. Freely speak. Aren't you thankful that someone had the boldness to speak to you? Aren't you impressed that someone spoke to you and acknowledged God in their life before you came to him? So what we have to say is, are we going to stop that right here? As far as where it comes to me, I will no longer utter this word of God to anyone else because I'm saved? No. No. We're saved by grace for his work, for his harvest. And along the way, there's a million blessings that happen. But to think that we are not here for some purpose and to speak to people about who he is. I challenged the Sunday school class and said, you know what, so many people want the United States to change and and become what it quote unquote used to be. And we want laws changed, and we want this, and we want this. But you know what? If you want the United States to be changed, then speak about God in the places that need to be spoken about God in. The marketplace, the school, the courts, and on and on. God will take care of the rest. We want a result without the work. And it doesn't work that way. God, change our hearts, change our attitudes. Help us to see the condition of the harvest through your eyes. Because obviously through our eyes, we'll just let it go. God, change us. Dear Lord, we just thank you 
I don't know if we thank you, though, all the time about things like this, Lord, but we thank you for loving us enough to write this passage about the first 12 students that you brought into class. And Lord, that that day came for them to be sent out for their final project, to be graded by what they heard, to find out if they were truly believers and disciples of yours. You said, go and speak and heal and all those things. And Lord, we know there was fear. But Lord, by extension, you have said in the end of Matthew, in that great 28th chapter, now I want you to go into all the world and do the same. And so, Lord, we do hear the call. And, Lord, I just pray that the Spirit of God would be identifying in our minds who you want us to speak to. And, Lord, I pray that you would be preparing the ground in their heart right now for the words of encouragement, the words of love, the words of, of saying, God is so close to you in this moment. All you have to do is turn to him and he is there. Lord, help us. Take away our fear. Give us the boldness that you gave Peter after his wimpiness that he had. That he spoke to that first day, 3,000 people became saved because he said, I will go and I will be a worker. Lord, may this be a challenge to us. May your spirit identify to us what we need to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stand together. You were the word at the beginning, the one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Because death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. Silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever. is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a powerful name 
nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus you have no rival you have no equal now in powerful name it is nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesians, <clears throat> says this, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the, ad the administration of this mystery for Ages past was kept hidden to God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. According to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. For this reason... I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Christ is. And to know this love and surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is in work within us. To him be the glory in the church, in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.